Hi, everyone. We're ready to start. So welcome to the Electrochemical Colloquium. Today, we're discussing single crystals and how they can be used in the studies of electrochemical phenomena, especially electrocatalysis. Um, so recently, I described in one of my papers that many studies in electrocatalysis involve electrodes that are ill-defined, or in other words, they're just too complex to disentangle all possible reactions. Um, for example, we know that crystal facets define electrochemical reactions to a substantial degree, and yet many studies are done with materials that have undefined facets, for example, in polycrystalline or nanomaterials. So these are what I call complex electrodes, and they can have heterogeneous conductivity, heterogeneous chemical composition, and in some cases, co-catalysts, conductive additives and binders, and whatever else that people put in those electrodes. In such cases, the electrochemical response is not recorded from well-defined active sites. And that significantly limits us when um, we want to test certain theories and want to understand how to correctly describe the electrocatalytic processes. So the alternative and ideal approach is to use single crystals that have, first of all, well-defined surfaces, and second, they are very easy to characterize and understand as compared to, say, polycrystalline systems. However, as you can imagine, working with single crystals can be quite challenging and uh, for some people even intimidating at the beginning. And so with this, I hope that today's colloquium will be highly useful to those of you who want to work with single crystals, but just do not know how to start and how to build your research agenda in this direction. And the person who will help us with it today is our speaker, Professor Victor Clement, who is among the leading experts in single crystal electrochemistry. So Victor has made a truly substantial contribution to our understanding of electrosorption, of electrocatalytic processes, and the double layer on metal surfaces. He received his PhD from the University of Alicante and did his postdoc at the University of Oxford. And since 2007, he's a professor at the University of Alicante. So Victor, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a big honor uh, for all of us to host you here. The stage is yours now. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. It's for me a pleasure to be here today and to be talking about the single crystal electrochemistry. And uh, it is really a very nice initiative, this one that you are uh, hosting, this kind of colloquium, that these new technologies that we have now allow to do this, which is amazing that we can join together all these people that I can see here in the in the audience uh, to, to be joining with this new technology. So I'm going to share my, my screen. Let's see if this works. This is the critical moment. <laughs> Okay, I think you are now able to see my, my screen. Yes, all works. Yeah. Okay, so I will be talking today about uh, platinum single crystals and platinum electrocatalysis. I decided to focus on platinum because it's the, the, the metal that we are more familiar. So this is a uh, outline I have this uh, screen at the top. I don't know if I can remove uh, this this bar. Which bar? Uh, the, the bar for, for Zoom that I'm sharing. You should be able my... to move it. Uh, yeah. Or you can minimize it. Yeah, I don't know. How. But anyway. Anyway, I will put, so I assume that you are not seeing it. So this is, uh, I will start again. So the, the idea is that I will be talking about uh, platinum electrochemistry. And this is a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about uh, today. So first, 
Uh, and you already uh, introduced the reason why we want to use single crystals. Then I will go to the very basics of uh, crystallography and I will introduce Miller indices and how we can uh, model the ideal sulfates with the hard sphere model and what we can calculate to compare with the experimental results. And then I will discuss a little bit uh, the method for the preparation of the, of the secret crystals. Then we will move to understanding the electrochemical reactivity of these single crystals. We are going to use the voltammetry as the uh, technique, standard technique for the characterization. Then uh, I will talk first about the basal planes and then about step surfaces that are a little bit more complex. And at the very end, I will talk about uh, nanoparticles with preferential shapes. So you will see how we can go from the very uh, ideal, very flat surface to the most complex surface. And then I will uh, show how we need to separate different charge contribution in order to understand the voltammeram of platinum. And for this, we need to use a technique that we have developed in, the, in our group in Alicante, which is the charge displacement. And then finally, I will show you how we can use these interfacial properties that we have learned how to measure. Um, we can use to, uh, to, to understand the electrocatalytic activity of the, of the electrode. So the most important property that we are going to, to characterize is the charge, because the charge in the, at the interface, the charge separation at the interface is going to control the electric field and the electric field is going to control the orientation of water molecules, it's going to control the uh, structure of the, of the interface, the, uh, the absorption of anions or cations. So this, this charge is going to be the most important property. We can, I will show you also how we can apply thermodynamic uh, analysis to, to extract uh, important information like uh, entropy of uh, formation of the double layer or entropy of absorption of, of different uh, species, uh, Gibbs energies of absorption and enthalpies of absorption. We can uh, learn all of that by a very simple thermodynamic analysis. And then we will see how we can correlate all this information with the electrocatalytic reactivity. So, First, just uh, a, a minute to, to say why we want to use single crystals. Obviously, if we have an electrocatalytic reaction, we have an interaction with the, uh, between the reactant and the surface, because this is the, the reason why uh, an electrode is catalytic, because it opens a new path in the, in the way from reactants to products, there is a new path that in, always involves the absorption of uh, some species. So these uh, absorbed species uh, will have a different energy of absorption, which is this, this height, that will depend on the, on the, on the place the, the species is absorbed. For instance, in this surface, it's uh, quite flat, but it already has some terraces, it has some steps, and if we look in this side, it's very heterogeneous. So depending on where these hydrogen atoms in this example is absorbed, we will have different absorption energy and then we will have different reactivity. So for a real examples, I have uh, selected formic acid oxidation. Here we are seeing the formic acid oxidation on uh, platinum 111, which is this hexagonal array. We will go through the nomenclature later, but uh, or you can already see that um, this is the same uh, material, this is platinum, this is the same solution, this composition with formic acid, but depending how we cut the electrode, we have a different uh, behavior. In this case, we have a current that is around 2, 2.5. In this case, we have cut in a different orientation, so we have this square orientation of the atom, a square arrangement of the atoms, and we have 10 times more current just simply by changing the orientation, how we cut the crystal. And not only it changes the maximum current, but also changes the mechanism. Because here 
we can see that the current in the forward scan is the same as the current in the second scan, in the, in the backward scan. But here there is a significant difference. In the, in the forward scan, the current is almost zero because uh, the surface is poisoned by carbon monoxide. So not only it changes the, the reactivity, it changes the very mechanism. The, in this case, for formic acid oxidation, we have different paths, and it changes the, uh, the magnitude of the reaction in each path. So first, as promised, I will give you some notion about surface crystallography. I will go to the very, very basics. So uh, I think this will be helpful for, for some students who want to learn about this topic. It may be a bit boring for some people who already know this, but uh, stay with me for a moment. So when we have a crystal, this, this could be a crystal, uh, which is a, a, a regular arrangement of atoms that uh, they are arranged in a, in a given, a given uh, crystallographic structure. So at the, at the end, we have these, these facets or these faces that represent the termination of the crystal. So we need to, to find a nomenclature to, to indicate which is the direction of this, of this uh, surface. Here we see uh, the hexagonal arrangement. Here we see a step uh, surface. We, we see there is a terrace, there is a step, there is a terrace, there is a step. Here we have a different arrangement. So we need a nomenclature to call of all of these uh, surfaces. So the first abstraction that we are doing is to call this facet by the plane, the mathematical plane that defines the, the surface. And we call this plane by calling the intersection with the crystallographic axis. So in this case, we have A, B, and C. And instead of calling the intersection, what we call is what is called the millet indexes, which are the reciprocal of the intersection. So in this case, if for example, we have three, one, two, so it will be the reciprocal, one over three, one over one, and one over two. And then we multiply by six to have three interest numbers. And what is nice about this nomenclature is that for cubic crystals, it represents a vector that is perpendicular to the surface. So this vector is the two, three, two, two six, three, which is perpendicular to the surface. Then we can use a typical uh, vector algebra to, to, to calculate all the properties of the surface. For instance, we can calculate the angle between two surfaces just by using the dot product between the two vectors. So this is a, a bit of convention. We use uh, round brackets to call the Miller indices of, of a surface. We use a square brackets to call a vector, but for uh, cubic crystals, they coincide. So there is no much worry about that. And then we use the curly brackets to represent all the family of surfaces that are equivalent by a symmetry operation. For instance, in this case, this could be the one, 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 this could be the one minus one, or this could be the minus one, one, one. So we call all of these surfaces using the curly brackets, we would say one, one, one for all of them. So for platinum, which is the metal that I'm going to talk uh, today, we have uh, a face center cubic structure, which is this structure. We have a cube, and then we have atoms on each of the surface of the of the, fat, of the of the sides. There is one atom on the center of each side of the cube. So when we repeat this structure over and over again, we have this uh, three dimensional arrangement of atoms that are a single crystal. When we talk about a single crystal, it means that all the uh, atoms are arranged according to the same crystallographic uh, axis. So when we talk about hard sphere model, we normally uh, we represent these atoms as spheres touching each other. So here we have this small space, or here we have this small space. Normally, when we plot a hard sphere model, we plot the surfaces, the, the spheres as touching each other. And already here, if we look at this arrangement of atoms, we can see that there are planes. So for instance, in this case, we have the 
this plane, which is a square arrangement, or in this case, we have the hexagonal arrangement. So now if we cut our, along this plane, we would have this plane of here, which is hexagonal arrangement. Or if we cut in this uh, direction, we will have the uh, square arrangement. So this uh, vector, because the intersection is one, 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 so the Miller indexes are one, one, one. In this case, the vector is one and zero on the y-axis and zero on the z-axis. So it's the one, zero, zero. And in this case, the vector perpendicular to the surface is the one on the x-axis, one on the y-axis, and zero on the z-axis. So it will be the one, one, zero. So as I said, if we cut in this orientation, we have this hexagonal arrangement. But if we cut in this orientation, we have this rectangular arrangement. So we can see the result here more clearly. So what you have to keep in mind is that for the 111, we have hexagonal arrangement. For the 100, squares. And for the 110, we have rectangles. Now, uh, it's very useful to um, plot all these surfaces on the stereographic uh, projection. The stereographic projection uh, implies to put the crystal in the center of a sphere and then to plot a, a beam that, that goes from the center and intersect the, the sphere. So this pole is it, usually called a pole is a, a spot on the surface of the sphere that is equivalent to the, to the surface that we have used to uh, plot the normal. So for instance, in this case, if we plot this normal to this surface, we would get this uh, spot here on this sphere. And now what we, then we have translated all the surfaces to spots on the, on the sphere. And then we translate these spots on the sphere to a plane by doing the stereographic projection. And to do this, we can imagine that we have a light source in this place. And then what we are looking is at the shadows that these points cast on this screen. So in this case, it, it is the same to look at this point or to look at this point. So the it is equivalent by a, a transformation. So this would be the stereographic projection for this surface. And then if we do the same for all the possible surfaces, we have this distribution of Miller indices. So you already see here that we have like uh, 110, and then we have, uh, for instance, 1 minus 10. So all of these will belong to the same uh, family of surfaces. So there is a minimum set of surfaces that we can consider representative of all the surface, all the possible surfaces in this in this crystal. And this is called the stereographic triangle. And we are going to go through the stereographic triangle describing how are the surfaces that correspond to each side of the stereographic triangle. So on the corners of the stereographic triangle, we have the basal planes that we have already described, the 100, 110, and 111. So this would be the structure. And what is important here is the unit, the unit cell. The unit cell for the 111 would be this uh, rhomboid here. And then the most important uh, parameter is the uh, surface of the unit cell. In this case, by uh, trigonometry, we can get that this square root of three over two times the diameter of the atom. In this case, the diameter of platinum that we can find in the handbook. For the one zero zero, the, the unit cell is just a square and the surface of the unit cell is uh, the diameter square. And for the 110, we have this rectangle. And this distance here is a square root uh, of two times the diameter. So why is so important this uh, unit cell? Because it allows us to 
calculate the atomic density. The atomic density will be just one over the uh, area of the unit cell. So if we plug in here the diameter of platinum, we have a number. If we make the reciprocal of this number, we have how many atoms we have in one square centimeter. And if we multiply this by the charge of the electron, then we have the charge that corresponds to uh, the interchange of one electron per atom on the surface. And this is very, very important for us because it gives us a reference number. So all the, charge that, all the charges that we are going to measure later need to be compared with this reference number. For platinum, if we plug here the diameter of platinum, the charge of the electron, then we get 241 microcolons per square centimeter. This is our reference number. If we have a charge that is half of this, we know that we have a process that involves one electron every two atoms. If it is the half, then one electron every two atoms. Or the same here with this number. So this number we should keep in mind. Now we move from the corners of the stereographic triangle to the edges. Uh, <clears throat> in this case, we cut the crystal, not in this uh, diagonal plane, but we shift the plane a little bit. And we are shifting between the 111 orientation, which is this one, and the 100 orientation. So we are moving along this axis. So if we are moving along this axis, we are moving in the stereographic projection along this axis. So in this case, we get surfaces that have 111 terras and then 100 step. And we can see here. So this is the 111 terras and this is the 100 step. And again, the most important uh, parameter that we need to calculate with this hard sphere model is the unit cell. So we need to calculate the dimensions of the unit cells. And for that, we need the length, we need the width, and also we need to be aware that the unit cell is tilted. It's not it does not coincide with the plane of the terrace, but it's tilted. So another parameter that we need to calculate is the height between two planes of the terrace. And in this case, because this is the 111 terrace, we need to know the interplanetary spacing between 111 planes. And it's very easy to see in this, in this plot here. We can see here that we have the 111 vector, and we have uh, divided the 111 vector by three. Okay. There are uh, one, two, three, four planes that cross the 111 vector. So we have three segments. It is probably more clear in this, in this representation. Here we see one, two, three. So the height, the interplanetary spacing is going to be the, the length of this vector, which is a, a square root of three times uh, the side of the cube and divided by three, because we have divided in three. And it is typical for us, instead of using the side of the cube, to use the diameter of the platinum, uh, which is just a, a square root. Uh, uh, it is a divided by square root of two. So we get this final number. So now we are going to uh, explain what is the length of the unit cell. And for this, I have drawn these uh, spheres. And then I want you to see how if we put the second, uh, the second uh, plane in this position, we can put the second plane here, or we can put it here. If we put it here, we are going to get the 111 step. So you see here the triangular arrangement of atoms characteristic of a 111 surface. But if we put the second plane in this position, what we get is the 100 step. You see here how there is a square arrangement of atoms. So the length of the terrace 
is going to depend on where, how is the symmetry of the step. So for, in this case, if we have one, two, three rows, we will have two times the distance between rows plus one third. So in general, if we have n rows, we will have n minus one distances between rows. The distance between rows, we already see that is uh, d, the diameter, square root of three over two. And if we have the one zero zero step, then we will have n minus one plus two thirds, because this distance is two thirds. So I have repeated the plot here. This would be the one 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 step, and this would be the one zero zero step. And in this case, the length, uh, we have five rows, one, two, three, four, five. And then the length will be five minus one plus two thirds, which is five minus one third. And in this case, we have five rows, one, two, three, four, five, and then plus one third. So it will be four times plus one third. So five minus two thirds. So, so with this, we have the length, we have the width, the width of the, of the unit cell is just the diameter. And then we have the height. So we have everything. We can calculate the surface of the unit cell. This would be the surface projected on the plane on the terrace. We have to multiply by the cosine of, of the angle to calculate or divide by the cosine of the angle to calculate the surface of the unit cell that is tilted. So this would be measured in this direction. And the real one, we need to divide by the cosine of beta. And with this, we can calculate the, atom, the atomic density of the surface. We can calculate the number of atoms the num on the terrace, the number of atoms on the steps, the charge involved for each uh, electron for each atom on the terrace, or the charge involved if we have a process that involves one electron per atom on the step. So we can calculate everything we want. And we are going to use that to compare with uh, the experimental, the voltammetric result for platinum. The last thing I'm going to show very, very fast is how we establish the relationship between the Miller indices and the, uh, the structure of the surface. In this case, we know that is uh, five rows, or in this case is six rows in the terrace and then the step. How we establish the relationship between these in Miller indexes and the real structure of the surface. And for that, what we have to look is at this triangle. And then we make a little bit of a vector algebra. So the length here is n minus one, and the length here is just d. And then we have to add these two vectors. And then we get the, the final result. So in this case, for the one zero zero step, the Miller indexes are n plus one, n minus one, n minus one. So in this case, if n is seven, it means that n is six. Because so this would be the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is a mistake. This will be the six. Four four surface. So this is probably a, a mistake. I I. So here we move to the other side of the stereographic triangle. In this case, we have a cut the crystal between the one 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 and the one one zero. So we have one 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 terrace, and then we have the one one zero step. In this case, we can consider the step both uh, 111 or 110. Because if we look at the stereographic projection, if we keep going between the 111 and the 110, we have the 11 minus 1. So in this case, the step, this step that I'm signaling here will be the 11 minus 1. And this, sorry. Sorry, and this step would be the one one zero. So we have 
the two possibilities to describe the same surface. So it's the same surface with two possibilities to describe description. So the description is what we do, but the surface is unique. In this case, as we discussed before, we have the length n minus two thirds, and, and the width is the diameter. So we have this is the size of the unit cell, and with it we can calculate the uh, number of steps per, uh, per cent square centimeter, the number of terra size per square centimeter, and so on. Again, we have to find the relationship between the structure and the Miller indexes. And for this, we just do some vector algebra. So a little bit in autopilot here. So this would be the result. N, N, N minus two. So in this case, if we have seven rows, it will be the 775 because N, coincides with this index. If we consider a one, one, zero, so this would be the vector that we have to add. In this case, the length is the square root of two times the diameter. And we get the same result, n, n, n minus two. So probably later when you have the YouTube video, you can pause the video and look at this equation more, more slowly. Okay, so here there is a reference, a uh, old paper by Somoje, where you can read about this uh, if you are interested. So we talk about zones uh, when we are uh, moving the plane along this axis. So these, all these uh, surfaces we say they correspond to the zone 0, 1, minus 1, because this axis is the vector 0, 1, minus 1. And here, when we are close to the 1, 1, 1, we have 1, 1, 1 terras and 1, 0, 0 step, which is this surface. So we have the 1, 1, 1 terras and the 1, 0, 0 step. But when we cross this point, what we have is 1, 0, 0 terras and then one, one, one step. This is this structure. You see the one, zero, zero structure, the square structure for the terrace. And then we have the step, which is the uh, triangular hexagonal structure. In this case, we have only four atoms marking the, the step. On the other side of the stereographic triangle, we have the one minus one, zero uh, zone because we are moving the plane along this axis is rotating along this axis so we are moving between the one 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 and the one one zero it will be this cut here so when we are close to the one 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 we have one 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 terrace and one one zero step is this case and when we are close to the one one zero we have one one zero terrace you can see here the terrace with the rectangular arrangement of atoms, and then the one, one, one step. So in this case, I have not plotted the surfaces, or I, I, don't pl I have not plotted the surfaces, but you can see, but you can imagine that closer to this, you have one, one, one terras, and then one, zero, zero step, and in this region, you have one, zero, zero terras, and one, one, zero step. So see, this is how, the surfaces are distributed around the stereographic triangle. This is a summary. And this table uh, you can find in this chapter. You can uh, find all the important uh, parameters to calculate all these uh, numbers. So now we move to the center of the stereographic triangle. And I said that the stereographic triangle represents a subset of all the surfaces that are equivalent to all the other possible surfaces. And they uh, are made by just by permutation of the numbers. So for instance, if you have the 133, 
some way you have the three, one, three, so they are equivalent, but they are equivalent by a symmetry it's a, a operation. And there is one symmetry operation, which is the specular reflection. And for the specular reflection, they are equivalent, but they are not the same. So we have two surfaces that are equivalent by a reflection, but they are not the same. So it's, uh, they have chirality. So in this case, the 643 will have an equivalent outside the geographic triangle that probably is a, another a arrangement of the indexes, maybe 463 or 346 or whatever, that will be a, a, a specular a, a specular uh, of this of this surface and then instead of calling by the miller indexes what we typically do is to call uh, this notation like in organic chemistry we call r when we are moving to the right from 111 100 110 so here we see the 111 this is the 100 and this is the 110 this is the rectangular shape of the 110 and because we have to turn right we call this r and in this case to go from the 111 100 and 110 we have to turn left so we call it s so even if probably this surface is a different arrangement of, of Miller indexes we call 643 but s to distinguish from this that is r and it has been detected different uh, stereo selectivity with these surfaces. So now we have gone to the edges, to the, to the sides of the stereographic triangles and to the center. So it's time to talk a little, a little bit about the preparation of, of the single crystal. So this is very nice. We, I have shown very nice pictures, but they are computer generated. So how we do this in real life. So the first thing we have to do is to create the single crystal. Uh, the, to make the single crystal, what we need always is to grow a new a new uh, phase, a solid phase from from another phase that can be a liquid or it can be vapor. So, for instance, we have from liquid to solid, it would be a solidification. So, so we have to melt the platinum and then to allow to cool down until it solidifies and makes a single crystal. Other ways to create, to grow a single crystal would be from liquid that can be a solution. So we would have uh, electrodeposition. So if we do the electrodeposition very slow, we can grow a single crystal. And another possibility would be from vapor deposition. We have the atoms in the vapor, and then we allow to cool down and to make the solid very slowly. But to make a, a three-dimensional piece of metal that is uh, macroscopic enough, so we need uh, to work with the, with the melting technique. We cannot use the electrodeposition or the vapor deposition because this uh, makes only thin layers. So in this case, what we do is we have a wire and then we have a, a flame and with the flame, we melt the end of the wire and we make this sphere. In this sphere, in this picture, you can see half of the sphere is solid and half is uh, melted. So if we move down the flame, we allow to cool down very, very slowly until we get a single crystal. A single crystal in this context means that there is only one crystal. All the atoms in this uh, sphere, in this sphere are arranged in the same crystallographic orientation. They share the same crystallographic axis. And on the surface of this sphere, we can see facets. So this is just a, 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 a computer generated graphics, but this is a real picture. And we can see there are facets corresponding to the surfaces of lowest energy. And this is a, a picture that I took from this uh, web page. And also they, uh, they show very nicely these uh, facets that correspond to the 111. 
terraces. So we can see here in this model, we can see the 111 like here, here, and here. And we can see the 100 here, here, and here. So the next thing that we have to do is to orientate this crystal before we cut. And to orientate, what we do is to look, uh, to put the crystal in a position where we have two 111 surfaces in the same horizontal plane. So here the horizontal plane would be uh, perpendicular to the screen. So we have this 111 and we have this 111, so rotating along this axis. And as it is shown here, we can get different surfaces. To do this, we use a laser. So we put the crystal in one end of the bench, and then we have a laser on the other end of the bench, and then we look at the reflections of the laser. So when the reflection of the laser come back in the same direction that the, that the incoming laser, then we know for sure that the surface is perpendicular to the laser. And then by rotating the crystal, we can prepare, for instance, in this case, the one, uh, one zero. So we are rotating in this direction. So we are moving the one one zero toward the center. So if we put the one one zero in the center, like it is now, then we can cut in this, in this orientation. Or if we rotate, to the other direction. Here we have the 111 again, and here we have the 100. And in between, we have all the surfaces that we want. So in between the 111 and the 110, we can cut all the step surfaces that we want. And if we want something in, inside the stereographic triangle, then we have to rotate first in this direction and then in this direction. And for this rotation, we have a goniometer that is uh, graduated and allow us to rotate on different axes to uh, position the surface that we want. So this, so here this will be a, a summary between the 111 and this point, we have surfaces with uh, 111 terras and 110 step in this region. In this region, we have surfaces with one, uh, one terras and one zero zero step. And here we have uh, one zero zero terras. So this is a, a square symmetry of the one zero zero terras and the one 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 step. So we have all three uh, zones and only if we want to cut something in this area or in this area, then we need to do two rotations. We need to rotate in this direction and then in this direction. For example, if we want this, we have to come back, come down, and then to rotate to the center. So the last step would be to cut the crystal. To cut the crystal, obviously, we don't have a knife so precise to cut as in this, uh, and in this movie. So what we really do is to have a polishing dish that uh, we press against the crystal and then we polish a long time, first with sandpaper or MA paper, and then we move to uh, some uh, diamond paste or alumina paste to end with some uh, specular uh, finish of the surface. So at the end, what we have is the wire, the bead that we have created by melting the wire, and then we have cut the, the bead to have like half an sphere. And the last step is to order this, uh, this surface and to clean this surface. So uh, you have to imagine that the last uh, size of uh, the polishing uh, paste that we use, uh, alumina or diamond paste, can be around a quarter of a, a micrometer. So this means that uh, even if you see a specular finish, the, the, the size of the grain is huge in comparison with the atomic size. So uh, we need to reorder this surface. And for this, we take advantage of the uh, flame. So if we heat uh, the, the electrode in a flame, we give enough uh, thermal energy to the atoms so they go to the equilibrium position. And also in the flame, the surface is the 
the contaminated. All the possible contamination, all the possible organic material that is absorbed on the surface is oxidized and is vaporized. So this picture is very nice because it's taken from the original laboratory of Jean Clavillier, who was the uh, pioneer that developed this method. And then the next step is to protect the sulfate with a drop of ultra pure water. And then we can move to the uh, electrochemical cell and we make the contact with the solution in the meniscus configuration. So we dip the electrode inside the solution and then we pull down, we pull up, we pull up until we make this meniscus. And in this way, only the surface is uh, in, contact, in contact with the solution. And with this technique, as I said, this technique was developed by Jean Clavillier. And this is a picture of the first uh, publication of a good voltammogram uh, of a platinum 111 prepared with this methodology and the con with uh, this method of decontamination. This is already 40 years ago. So for other surfaces, uh, the step of cooling down need to be done in a controlled atmosphere. So in the case of platinum 100, we get a different behavior, voltammetric behavior, if we do the cool down in air or if we do the cool down in a hydrogen plus argon atmosphere. So this is the setup that we use for the cooling down of the after the flame annealing. So here you can see the Bunsen flame. So here we would do the, the annealing and then we would introduce here to make the, the to, to wait a little bit, maybe uh, 10 seconds or 40 seconds to, to cool down. And then we dip the electrode inside the, the, the water. This is just water we dip the electrode into the water to protect with a drop of ultra pure water that is saturated with these gases. For the platinum 111, there is almost no difference if you cool down in air or if you cool down in the control atmosphere. But now uh, it is customary in our lab to use this cooling technique because uh, you have more control over the cooling atmosphere. So typically we cool down always in a mixture of hydrogen and argon. So this is uh, how we prepare the electrodes, but you have to keep in mind that all the pictures that I have uh, drawn uh, are ideal pictures, but the real, the real surface is not as nice as this. So you have uh, terraces, you have steps, you have defects, but uh, still, the density of defects is low enough, so we can consider that the uh, crystal is quite close to the ideal uh, behavior. For instance, in the case of the 1CO0 surface, it has been shown several times that uh, depending on how you cool the crystal, even in hydrogen, you can get this uh, defect. So the, the surface is quite defective. You, you have some wide terraces, but also you have these small uh, places, square places, where you have uh, a step between this and this. So uh, this uh, defective surface is generated due to the uh, reconstruction that happens during the flame annealing. So in the flame, the surface is reconstructed, when you contact the surface with the solution, the reconstruction is lifted, and then you end with this uh, defective surface. So even uh, the best surface is going to have defects. So you have to keep that in mind. And then uh, a little reflection about the voltammetry. We have not talked about the voltammetry yet, uh, but uh, here I show the voltammetry of a 111 surface in sulfuric acid. So it's characteristic uh, for this uh, sharp peak, which is uh, corresponds to a phase transition in the sulfate absorption. And then I show you, in this case, a contaminated surface. And it's contaminated because we have done some uh, infrared uh, measurements with this surface. So at the beginning, it was clean like this. And at the end, it was like the red one. So the red one, we know that is contaminated because there is a no sharp peak. And also, there is some uh, deviation in the region. So. Uh, so this is just a reflection that I, I'm making that in most papers, they show the voltammogram at the beginning, 
and then they do some very long experiment. It can be infrared measurement, it can be Raman measurement, it can be a, a X-ray measurement in a synchrotron facility that takes several hours, and they never show what is the voltammogram at the end. So this is uh, something that I want to point out that uh, you have to be aware that sometimes these results corresponds to a contaminated surface, not the ideal surface that we all have in mind. So now we move to uh, the voltammetry of platinum. So this is the three basal planes, and these are the voltammograms that we get for uh, platinum 111, platinum 100, and platinum 110 in sulfuric acid and in perchloric acid. So we already see that there is a big difference between the three surfaces. So the, just by, as I said at the beginning, is the same material, is the same solution, but just by changing the angle that we polish, that we cut the crystal, we get a very different voltammetric behavior. And also it's very sensitive to the presence of, uh, to the, to the uh, composition of the solution. In this case, the presence of an ion that can absorb specifically. So the, the, the result of the presence of the sulfate is like a compression of the voltammogram. So we have, uh, it's like we put a hand here and we compress in this direction uh, because uh, all the absorption state has shifted to lower potentials. In the case of the 110, we see a very sharp peak and we will see later that this peak corresponds to a mixture of processes. So the fact that we see a peak doesn't mean that it's a single process as we need to separate these contributions. So uh, just a little bit uh, talking about the, the absorption, the, the, the absorption isotherm. So when we have a electrosorption process, we have a, a region that contains the double layer capacity, and then we have the peak corresponding the absorption process. In general, we talk about pseudo capacity to include both contributions. And I will explain later that uh, it is not possible to separate the, the charge corresponding to the absorption process to the charge corresponding to the capacity process. So in this, this region, we would have charge separation, the metal is negative, the solution is positive. And in this region, what we have is absorption. So we have the formation of a covalent bond. So this uh, is the microscopic description, but from a uh, macroscopic uh, view, we cannot separate both contributions. So we talk about solar capacity. So from a uh, Langmuir isotherm, you can get that you get a peak like this, corresponding to the, to the voltammogram of an electrosorption process that follows a Langmuir isotherm. So in this case, the width of the peak is fixed, is uh, 90 millivolts. In the case of platinum, we have seen that we have sharper peaks, we have broader peaks, so we cannot represent the absorption processes in platinum just by Langmuir isotherm. So we have to use the Frumkin isotherm. In the Frumkin isotherm, we introduce the lateral interaction and depending on the lateral interaction, we can have very sharp peaks, or we can have very broad peaks. And this allows us to explain the, uh, the voltammetry of platinum in general. So more or less, we, can, we could say that the position of the peak is related with the energy of absorption the area under the peak is related with the amount of substance. We can integrate the area and calculate how much substance or how much is the coverage. And the width of the peak is related with the lateral interaction. So if there is attractive interaction or there are repulsive interactions. So <clears throat> now we come to the, to the voltammogram again. And with this knowledge, we compare with the uh, polycrystalline the voltammogram of a polycrystalline platinum. So in a polycrystalline platinum, we have all the facets and then we have all the contributions. So by comparing with the single crystals, we can tell that this is due to the 110. This is due to 100 steps. And this is a nice distinction that we can do when we use step surfaces. We see that this peak corresponds to 100 geometry but not 100 terras, but 100 steps. 
And this region here corresponds to the 100 terrace. That in this case, there is little terrace because it's a polycrystalline material. And then this small peak here corresponds to the 111. As I said before, one parameter that we need to use as a reference is the charge corresponding to one electron per unit cell. And in the case of platinum 111 is sulfuric acid, if we integrate all the charge like it is uh, here, we get 240 that coincides very well with the charge corresponding to one electron, the platinum atom. So at the beginning, in the 80s, this led to the misinterpretation that everything was hydrogen. Uh, but then later, or soon later, it was realized that uh, the behavior of this part and the behavior of this part was different uh, depending on the concentration of the sulfate or the concent of the pH, they move different in different ways. So uh, it is necessary to separate what is hydrogen from what is uh, an ion absorption. And the reason that we see only positive currents here is because we are seeing hydrogen absorption and hydrogen absorption, uh, sorry, in this case, we have hydrogen desorption and hydrogen desorption uh, gives an oxidation. And then in this case, we have an ion absorption and the ion absorption is also an oxidation. So it is not possible from a voltammetric experiment uh, to separate both contributions. In the case of uh, 110 or 100, the situation is even worse because we have only one peak. Here you could say, okay, between this region we have something and in this region we have something. But in this case, we have only one peak. So one peak does not meet one process. We need to separate the two processes. And for this, we use the CO displacement experiment. In this experiment, we introduce carbon monoxide. The carbon monoxide adsorbs on the surface very, very strongly and uh, displaces everything that is present on the surface. So in this case, we are changing the direction of the, of the reaction. In this case, we have this option, and, uh, which is an uh, oxidation. And in this case, the this option is a reduction. So before it was absorption of an ion and this option of hydrogen. Here we have both in the same direction of this option. So both are this option, one is positive and the other is negative. So the way we do the experiment is we have the electrode and then we introduce carbon monoxide and we monitor the current that flows during the absorption of carbon monoxide. So this would be the, the experiment. First, we record the voltammogram and we uh, uh, hold the potential at uh, the desired value. Then we introduce the carbon monoxide and we record the current. Then we check that the surface has been completely blocked by the carbon monoxide. And finally, we can oxidize the carbon monoxide. This is why carbon monoxide is so nice to do this experiment because we, first, because it absorbs very strongly, and second, because we can remove the carbon monoxide just by oxidizing. And then we recover the, the initial state of the surface. So this is very nice because we can check that from the beginning to the end, nothing has happened to the surface. The surface is still ordered and it's still clean. And in this way, we can uh, calculate the charge that is displaced at different potential. If we introduce the carbon monoxide at this potential, we get this positive uh, charge that corresponds to the desorption of hydrogen. Desorption of hydrogen is positive charge. And if we introduce the carbon monoxide at this potential, what we get is negative charge because we are desorbing an anion. And the anion needs to be reduced to be desorbed. There is a characteristic potential where the displaced charge is zero. And we will see later that this corresponds to the potential of zero charge of the, of the metal. So now we can understand the, the voltammetry of platinum. So we start with a surface that is covered with hydrogen and at, at very low potentials because the charge corresponding to one electron is 240 and the charge that we displace is 160, it means that only two thirds of the surface are covered by hydrogen. We believe that we don't complete the surface because we have the interference of hydrogen evolution. We cannot move 
uh, to lower potential because, because we have the hydrogen evolution. So we can only complete two thirds of the surface. Then starting from these two thirds of the surface covered with hydrogen, if we increase the potential, we oxidize the hydrogen. At this potential, we have removed all the hydrogen and then we have an absorption process. So we know that this is an anion because we uh, displace a negative charge in this region. Then if we go back, we remove this anion and then we absorb the hydrogen again. So here we would have the free surface without an ion or cation. Here we have the surface covered with hydrogen. So the question is, what is this uh, anion? So we have petroic acid. So this is uh, petroic acid. So it is typically assumed that petroate does not absorb. So the only anion that can be absorbed is OH that comes from the dissociation of water. And the proof that this is OH is that uh, the same voltamoram or similar shape of the voltamoram is obtained in different solutions of without perchlorate. In this case, with uh, fluoridic acid, or in this case, with this uh, trifluoromethyl sulfonic acid, the same shape is obtained. So what is common to the different solution is only the OH that comes from the water. It's not the perchlorate, it's not the fluoride, it's not the trifluoromethyl sulfonate, is the OH what is absorbed. Now we go to the uh, 100. In the 100, we displace around 200 microcolons per square centimeter, and the reference number is 210. So it means that in this case, we complete the monolayer of hydrogen. Then when we increase the potential, we oxidize, and then we absorb the OH. Again, we can tell that this is OH because it coincides uh, between perchloric acid and uh, trifluoromethyl sulfonate. And the total charge here is around 260 because we have a contribution of hydrogen and we have a contribution of OH. So we have used the CO displacement to separate both contributions. The same happens with the 110. We have nearly a monolayer. And then when we increase the potential, the hydrogen is oxidized and then the OH is absorbed. In the case of 1COC, as already mentioned, uh, the surface uh, is very defective because at high temperatures in the flame annealing, uh, we create a hexagonal reconstruction that is lifted when we contact the, the surface with the solution and then uh, the lifting of the rock obstruction leads to this defective surface. And we believe that this peak and this contribution here is due to this inherent uh, defective surface that we cannot uh, improve even under the best conditions. Uh, more recently, uh, we have uh, or different laboratories are starting to use a cooling uh, atmosphere that contains carbon monoxide. And if we cool in carbon monoxide, then we have a better, a better structure. But even under this condition, we have this peak and we have this contribution. So even under the best condition, we have this uh, defective surface. And this uh, presence of carbon monoxide has a very significant influence on the voltamoram of 110. In this uh, paper by Guy Attard in 2015, he showed how uh, the cooling atmosphere, the cooling atmosphere changed uh, the voltamoram of platinum 110 very, very much. So uh, until this moment, the standard voltammetry of platinum 110 in perchloric acid was the red one. And in this paper, they showed that if you cool down in carbon monoxide, the voltamoram changes a lot and you have these uh, different peaks. And uh, they, this author attribute this to the uh, one by one structure. The, the 110 structure has two, two possibilities. Uh, the one by one, that is the one that we have seen, that is a rectangular arrangement of atoms. And the one by two, in which every two rows of atom, one row is missing. So here we have removed this row. Here we have removed the row. So this is the reconstruction that is called the one by two. And uh, 
according to these authors, when you cool down in hydrogen, you would get the one by two or maybe a mixture of the one by two and the one by one. And when you cool down in carbon monoxide, what you get is the one by one, the two one by one structure. So this is just an example of how uh, even under, for a single crystal under the best condition, you get something that can be a little bit uh, complicated. So if instead of a single crystal, you are using a polycrystalline materials, then you have no control at all with all these uh, details. So if you want to study uh, uh, an uh, electrocatalytic reaction, then uh, you need to control and even uh, by the most exquisite control, you have to take into account that the surface may contain some defects. So this, this by one by one and one by two structure was already uh, detected in 1996 by uh, Nenad Markovic in this paper. So I put the reference here so you, you are aware of this. So now we move to the, to the voltammetry of, um, of the step surfaces. So here, as I already mentioned, we have uh, something between the 111 and 110. So we have 111 terras a 110 step. Uh, first, we have checked with STM that uh, the structure, the real structure, is the coincides with the uh, hard sphere model. So this is an STM image, and we can see the length of the terras and the length of the terras coincide what, uh, with what you can calculate with the hard sphere model. And this is the voltammeran that you get from uh, these step surfaces. So what we see here is that as we introduce steps, we have this peak that is growing. So we can attribute this peak to the contribution of the step. Uh, this was in petrolic acid, and this is in sulfuric acid. So more or less, the sulfate does not have effect on the absorption on the step. So the contribution of the step is not affected by the presence of the uh, sulfate. Then we can assign the different contributions to hydrogen on the steps. This would be hydrogen on the terraces, and this would be OH on the terrace. And then we can integrate the charge of the different contribution, and we can compare with the hard sphere model that we have discussed before. So we get uh, this kind of plot. Here we have the charge of the, of the step as a function of the step density. So when we move to the right, we are increasing the number of steps. The line would be the hard sphere model, and the dots would be the charge integrating from the voltammeran. And we see very good coincidence at low step densities. And at higher step densities, there is a small deviation that is probably due to the uh, anion assumption. So uh, we are considering that only hydrogen is absorbing and this seems to be true for long terraces, but for short terraces, it seems that there is some OH or an ion absorption on the step. Regarding the charge on the terrace, the, this uh, point correspond to the integration of the voltammeran, and this is the uh, hard sphere model. If you remember, I mentioned that for these terraces, uh, for, for this geometry, you can consider the step being 111, or being one one zero. If we consider the step one one one, we would have n minus one atoms on the terrace. But if we consider the one one zero step, we would have n minus two. And the experimental values correlate better with the n minus two model. So it seems that the electrochemical behavior is uh, the one that corresponds to a one one zero step. So we can uh, do the same with uh, surfaces with 111 terras and 100 step. That would be this side of the stereographic triangle. In this case, we see that there is a, a strong effect of the presence of sulfate. So this uh, peak is very, very sharp in the presence of sulfate in comparison with the perchlorate. And uh, there is a strong deviation of the experimental charge and the hard sphere model that we believe is due to the 
anion absorption. And still, the charge of the step correlates very well with the charge of the uh, hard sphere model. Uh, this would be the step, and this would be the terrace. And finally, the, the last part of the stereographic triangle that I want to discuss is this um, when we move from the 1 1 terrace to the 1 0 0 terrace. In this case, we have this turning point. The 3 1 1 would be the turning point. Above this point, what we have is 1 1 1 terrace. And below this point, we have 1 0 0 terrace. So this is the 2 1 1. We have the 1 1 1 terrace. Here, the turning point has two rows on the terrace and two rows on the step. This would be the 1 0 0 step. And then when we move to the other side, what it was the terrace, now it has become the step. And the 1 0 0 is the terrace. So what we see in the voltammogram is that when we start with a 1 1 1 terrace and 1 0 0 step, we have this peak. This peak corresponds to the contribution to the 1 0 0 step. But then when we cross the turning point, the turning point is the 3 1 1, this step is still there. So this step, this, this, this peak should correspond to a arrangement of atoms that is uh, the, the, the intersection of the terrace and the step. So here we have what it was the step, the one zero zero step, it gives this peak and here the edge of the terrace that is close to the 111 step is the one that gives this peak. So in this case, we have 100 terrace. In this case, we have 100 step, but this region here, this atomic arrangement of atoms next to the step would be the same and it gives the same peak. So this is the summary. So this would be the uh, step surface that contains 111 terras and 100 step. So this is the, the this is the terras and this is the step. And in this case, we have 100 terras and we have the 111 step. So this would be the terras edge, the, the last row of atoms on the on the terras. And this would be the terras. So we will assign this peak to monodimensional arrangement of a square uh, atoms or of a square arrangement of atoms. This, uh, as we did before with the 111 terras, we have also obtained STM images with uh, 100 terras, and uh, the STM uh, uh, is um, proves that the structure is the same that corresponds to the hard sphere model. And we can integrate the different contribution and we can compare with the hard sphere model. And again, we have a reasonable uh, coincidence. So now we move to the, to the charge. And the, 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 one of the most important uh, uh, properties of the electrified interface is that there is a charge separation. And this charge separation uh, is what uh, creates the, um, the electric field that uh, orientates the water that uh, is going to attract the anions, is going to attract the cations. So this electric field is, uh, uh, it will depend on the charge separation. So it's very important to uh, characterize this charge separation. And well, here I plotted the, the water because the, the metal is positive. I tried to plot, this is just a cartoon, I tried to plot the water with the oxygen towards the metal and the hydrogen pointing away from the metal. And in this case, because the metal is negative, I tried to, to plot the water with the hydrogen towards the metal because uh, of course, water is uh, has a dipole moment, and it will orientate uh, according to the electric field. So this is just a cartoon that I made, 
but this is uh, one, there are many, uh, there are several publications in the literature that have calculated by molecular dynamics. And this is just one example. And you can see that uh, the, the, the picture that emerged from the computer simulation is the same that I have plotted. When the metal is positively charged, the, uh, in this case, negatively charged, we have the hydrogen towards the metal. And when the metal is positively charged, in this case, they have included fluoride uh, that creates a positive charge on the metal, then the water turns over to, uh, to orientate the oxygen towards the metal. And this change of orientation, we believe it has very important consequences on the reactivity. So in the next, in the, in the following part of the talk, I'm going to, to explain how we can characterize this uh, uh, orientation of the water, how can we measure the, the charge and the orientation of the water. These are some examples uh, of how this charge is so important. For instance, this is a, a hydrogen uh, peroxide reduction and oxidation. Here we have hydrogen peroxide oxidation, and in this region, hydrogen peroxide reduction. And surprisingly, for a reduction, when you apply a negative a potential, a negative um, over potential, you would expect that the current would increase. Uh, here we have the plateau corresponding to the diffusion or mass transport limit. So you would expect this plateau to continue. However, when you apply more negative potential, you see a decrease of current. So this is totally unexpected for a reduction. You would expect to increase or, or maintain constant. So this decrease was uh, interpreted at the beginning as due to the competition with the hydrogen absorption. So in this region, the platinum is uh, covered with hydrogen and this hydrogen will compete with the hydrogen peroxide molecule and it will decrease. However, we have shown that when we increase the pH, uh, the potential where this inhibition happens is not shifted. So the hydrogen absorption shifts strongly with the pH because it's a reaction that is, um, follows Nest law and decreases with the pH. However, this, this potential of the inhibition does not shift. And at high potential, like uh, you can see in the green line, the inhibition happens in a potential region where there is no hydrogen absorption at all. So it cannot be the, the hydrogen absorption. And the explanation is that it is the, uh, the charge what is, uh, what is inhibiting the hydrogen peroxide reduction. Another example is the uh, uh, peroxodisulfate reduction. This is a molecule that, or, or an anion that has been studied uh, by Frumkin uh, in the 60s, 70s, uh, or even before, as a model for the reduction of anions. And uh, with studying this uh, anion, uh, Frumkin came with what then was called the Frumkin effect. That is an inhibition uh, for negative potentials for the reduction of an anion. And we see that this that was published by Frumkin for mercury, uh, is also valid in the case of platinum. We see that this inhibition that you could mistakenly uh, uh, think that is due to the coadsorption of hydrogen, uh, in, when you increase the pH, this inhibition takes place in a region where there is no uh, absorption of hydrogen. Um, and in this case, even uh, in a region where the surface is completely free. So what is causing this decrease? We believe it's due to the uh, charge. Somehow the charge plays a preferential role uh, controlling the reactivity of the, of the surface. So you can, you can find this paper is still in press uh, where uh, Jung Huang uh, have come with a, a explanation for this effect of the of the charge. Uh, in this case, for the hydrogen peroxide, he came with the idea that the that the uh, charge controls the distance between the hydrogen peroxide molecule and the surface, and this distance is what uh, increases when you have negative charge, and then uh, causes this uh, decrease of this inhibition. 
So we come to this conclusion that uh, it is very, very important to, to know the potential of zero charge because uh, the charge plays a significant role, but what we control in our experiment is the potential. So to establish the correlation between potential and charge, we need to know the potential of zero charge. For gold, it was typically done by, um, by uh, locating the minimum in the differential capacity that according to the Wichermann uh, theory, this minimum corresponds to the potential of zero charge. However, for platinum, it's not so easy to get this minimum. It has been Mm, there has been several groups that have tried to, to, to measure this, this minimum. And only very recently, the group of uh, Mark Copper have published uh, that uh, you need to go to very dilute solution in order to get this minimum. And anyway, you can only get this minimum in the 111 surface where you have the separation between the uh, hydrogen and the OH. So in general, you cannot. Uh, you cannot determine the potential of zero charge by looking at the, at the minimum in the differential capacity. So this is, this is the, um, the green light. Uh, the green light is the, um, sorry. Yeah, is the very dilute uh, solution that you can find the, uh, the minimum in the capacity. So not only it is difficult to measure the, the differential, the minimum in the differential capacity, is uh, the very, very concept of uh, the potential of zero charge is more complicated in the case of platinum. And the reason is because we have uh, an electrosorption process. So as I mentioned at the beginning, from a thermodynamic point of view, it is not possible to separate the uh, charge that is in the absorption process from the charge that is in the uh, pseudo capacity, uh, the pseudo capacity charge. And uh, this can be seen in the, in the thermodynamic equation that uh, controls the interface, that is the electrocapillary equation. In the case of a platinum interface, we would have to consider both the, the, the cation, the proton, and the absorbed hydrogen, the anion and the absorbed anion. So these would be different species that are linked by an equilibrium. So if we take it into account this equilibrium, we get an electrocapillary equation that has a single term that we call total charge. So according to this equation, we have the, the, the thermodynamic magnitude, the only thermodynamic magnitude that we can access is the total charge. That is a combination of the free charge and the charge in the absorption processes. So in this case, you cannot separate the charge corresponding to, to hydrogen absorbed or the charge corresponding to hydrogen, uh, ionic, ionic hydrogen. To, to illustrate this, we could say that uh, the charge can be defined as the charge that flows through the external circuit when you create a new unit of charge. And uh, in this case, you need to flow four electrons to create this interface. But then if part of this charge is neutralized by formation of covalent bonds, the charge has already flown through the external circuit, so you cannot separate. So the idea is that you cannot separate. You cannot distinguish this situation from this situation. The difference is only a reorganization in the microscopic description of the, in the microscopic description. So here you have four negative charges. Here you have two negative charges and two other negative charges that are stored in the covalent bond. What we can do is to use the CO displacement to displace all the charge. So in this situation, we what we are going to measure with the CO displacement is the total charge, the total charge that was present here. Two negative charges that are true charge and two uh, negative charge that are stored in the covalent bond. So when we do the CO displacement, we can combine the CO displacement with the integration of the voltammogram. So the integration of the voltammogram 
give us only a uh, increment of charge. And in order to get a true charge curve, we need to an integration constant. So in every integration, you need an integration constant. And in this case, the integration constant comes from the CO displacement experiment. In this case, we have done the CO displacement at different potentials, and the blue is the integration of the voltameron. And we see that they fit quite well. So we only need to do the CO displacement at one potential to fit the curve. So with one displacement and the integration of the voltameron, we can get this curve. That is the charge as a function of potential. And the intersection with the x-axis is the potential of zero total charge. So at this point, the charge is zero. There is a, a refinement that needs to be done because we are considering that with the assumption of zero, we are displacing the, all the charge that was present. So we are considering that the charge at the end after the assumption of zero is zero. In reality, we should say that the charge displaced is the charge at the end minus the charge at the beginning. And the charge at the end, we have to integrate from the knowledge of the potential of zero charge of the zero covered surface. And this uh, is difficult to measure, but was measured by Angel Cuesta and was estimated before by Mike Weaver. And uh, it is around one volt. So if we consider this potential of CO charge for the CO covered surface, and we know the differential capacity of the CO covered surface, we can estimate the charge that is uh, in the potential of the experiment that is around 10 microcolumns. So it means that we need to shift this curve 10 microcolumns, around 10 or 13 microcolumns. So the true or corrected potential of CO charge would be this value. So the question is, I said that we cannot calculate the, we cannot separate the total from the free charge. We can only measure the total charge. So can we say something about the free charge? Well, there are two approaches that I want to mention now. And the first one is to consider that for platinum 111, because we have a well separation between the hydrogen absorption and the OH absorption, there is a region where there is no absorption. So in this region, the total charge and the free charge coincide. There is no hydrogen absorption. So total charge and free charge are the same. So in this region, we know the free charge. And if we know the free charge in one region, we can extrapolate to calculate the potential of zero free charge. So this would be the potential of zero total charge, and this would be the potential of zero free charge. So if we do this correction, taking into account the remaining charge after the CO displacement, this would be the potential of CO free charge after the correction. So this would be the best estimate that we have of the potential of free of free charge. We have studied the effect of um, steps on the, on the potential of CO total charge. We have compared this with the work function and we have seen that the potential of CO free charge and the work function is shift in a similar way due to the introduction of steps. And this is uh, well known in the high vacuum that this is due to the uh, creation of uh, dipoles at, at the steps due to the spillover of electrons from the top of the step to the bottom of the step. So the step uh, is polarized and this dipole decreases the work function. And the conclusion from this study would be that the behavior in solution is not so different from the behavior in the high vacuum. We have also studied the effect of the pH, and we have seen that the potential of zero free charge that coincides, because in this region there is no absorption, so in this region the potential of free charge and the potential of total charge coincide, so is around 0.3. So this would be the best estimate that we have at this moment for the potential of zero free charge of platinum 111, around 0.3. And <clears throat> there are other uh, information that we can get from the, from the electrocapillary equation. We can 
not only uh, obtain the charge, but we can also obtain surface coverage. So uh, in this case, just very, very briefly, uh, the starting point is to record the charge for different concentration, in this case of sulfate. So we recorded the voltammogram in different concentration of sulfate. We integrate the voltammogram in combination with the CO displacement. So we get the charge for different uh, concentration. So we can, starting from the electrocapillary equation, we can calculate the surface coverage. And this is uh, the result. This is how the surface coverage of sulfate changes with the uh, potential. And we have done for different anions. So the message that I want to, to give you here is that there is a lot of thermodynamic information that we can obtain by applying the electrocapillary equation to these systems. So for instance, one important magnitude that we can calculate is the charge number. This charge number is the charge that flows through the external circuit for each mole of molecules that it absorbs. Uh, and similar thermodynamic analysis led us to the estimation of the differential capacity. So uh, in this case, again, because uh, in general, the message that you have to take home is that it is not possible to separate total charge from uh, free charge. But in some cases, as in the case of platinum uh, 111, because the hydrogen and the OH are well separated, there is an assumption that you can make that there is no absorption in this region, so you can get more extra information. And this follows an analysis that was done by uh, Frumkin on polycrystalline platinum that we repeated uh, several, many years ago for, for platinum 111, and uh, we were able to obtain the differential capacity for the uh, for the the differential capacity as a different from the total capacity so the total capacity includes the absorption process and the double layer capacity includes only the free charge the contribution from the free charge this would be the total capacity and this would be the contribution from the from the free charge and now with the knowledge of this uh, total charge that comes from the co displacement and the differential capacity that we can obtain from this thermodynamic analysis, we can get a best, uh, better refinement of the potential of CO3 charge. And again, we see that in this case, they coincide. They coincide because they are located in the potential, in the region of the double layer. So in this region, there is no absorption and potential of CO total charge and potential of CO3 charge coincide. The next thing that I want to talk about is about the, the variation of the temperature. So let me let me skip very very fast because I'm running out of time. But uh, the idea is that in the electrocapillary equation you have an, also a term that includes the temperature that normally is not considered, but it can give us a lot of information. And the information that can give us is the entropy, the entropy of the interface. So what I try to explain here with this cross is that uh, what you measure is not really the entropy of the interface, but the entropy of formation of the interface, which is the difference between the entropy of the interface and the entropy of the components of the interface in the bulk phases. So this, this uh, entropy of formation is what you can measure if you change the temperature. And if you record the charge, this is again total charge, that we have measured with the integration of the voltammogram and the CO displacement. So we have the curve for the total charge at different, uh, different temperatures. So from this, we can obtain the entropy of formation of the interface. So again, we have two magnitudes. We have like the total entropy that includes the absorption processes and the entropy of the double layer that would be associated only with the with the free charge with the with the double layer that uh, excluding the absorption processes. So the question is, how can we make this change of temperature without changing the coverage of hydrogen or OH without the absorption processes? And the answer is by doing a very very fast change of temperature. And this brings me to the laser temperature jam experiment. In this experiment, we uh, 
we shine the electrode with a beam of a laser and, and this causes a very, very sudden increase of temperature. And the increase of temperature takes place in the nanosecond time scale. So there is no time for the absorption to respond. So somehow we are freezing the state of the surface and we are measuring the response, the thermal coefficient of the surface of a surface that is frozen as a, uh, in a very uh, specific absorption state. So in this experiment, we have uh, very briefly, we have repeated a different pH. At pH one, we see a shape that is not following the change of the temperature. The, ten of, the change of the temperature is uh, heating for five nanoseconds and then cooling down. And here we see some bipolar shape. So there is something going on. And what is going on is the absorption of hydrogen. So the absorption of hydrogen on platinum 111 is so fast that it's able to follow in the microsecond time scale. But if we increase the pH uh, to pH 4, then we see a monotonous decay. In this case, it is following the shape of the transient of the temperature. So we can say that at pH4, we have the couple, the um, absorption process from the double layer process. So in this case, uh, the double layer process, we explain in this way. When we uh, have a negative uh, charge electrode, we have the water dipoles with the uh, hydrogen towards the metal. So this gives a positive contribution to the potential drop. And then when we heat, with the, with the laser, we disorder these dipoles. So we, um, we remove this positive contribution and removing a positive contribution causes a negative transient. So a negative potential, we have a negative transient because we are disordering a positive contribution. And at positive potential, so this red curve is a positive potential. So at positive potential, we have a negative dipolar contribution to the potential drop and disordering this negative contribution, it creates a positive transient. So the most important potential is where we don't have contribution, would be this blue line that correspond to this potential that correspond quite well with the potential of CO charge. So with the, uh, this technique, we are able to determine what we call the potential of maximum entropy because it's the potential where there is a maximum disorder in water and because the ordering of water is uh, uh, governed in by uh, the electric field. So the potential of maximum entropy coincides quite well with the, with the potential of CO3 charge. So in this way, we have been able to, let me skip this, to be able to measure the potential of CO3 charge for different platinum surfaces. So mm, not only for the 111, which is the one that you can measure with the differential uh, capacity and the Wichelman differential capacity, but also for the 100 or 110 that is uh, in a region that is not accessible by other techniques. And this is, this is the result. This is the potential of maximum entropy and the, the lines here are the potential of total CO total charge. So we would say that this is the potential of CO total charge, and this is the potential of CO free charge. In, in reality, it's the potential of maximum entropy that we assimilate to the potential of free charge, CO free charge. And this difference is because these two magnitudes, total charge and free charge, are different. So let me skip a little bit. We have uh, characterized uh, surfaces that have been modified with uh, ad atoms, in this case with nickel, by introducing the electrode in a solution that contains nickel sulfate, we can deposit nickel on the, on the surface of the electrode. And this has been seen by us and by other groups that catalyzes the uh, hydrogen evolution. So the question is why nickel is uh, able to catalyze the hydrogen evolution. And our answer is that the the deposition of nickel decreases in the, this is the, th the thermal coefficient of the, of the surface modified with nickel. This means this is the, the magnitude of the transient. Somehow this is a measure of the magnitude of the transient. 
the magnitude of the transient, remember that is related with the orientation of water. When there is no orientation of water, there is no transient. So in this region, the magnitude of the transient is very small, and we achieve that by increasing the coverage with nickel. So this would be the clean surface, and as we increase the coverage of nickel, we decrease the orientation of water. So somehow we could say that the decrease of the orientation of water is what is helping the hydrogen evolution reaction. So now this is the experimental result. We see a correlation. We need some computational studies to explain why this is so. And let me let me skip a little bit because uh, I think I extending too much. And I want to just give a, a, a couple of slides or a few slides talking about nanoparticles, because I think this is the bridge that uh, closes the gap between the very, very fundamental studies and the more applied studies that can be done with real uh, electrocatalysts. Uh, in our group, there are there is, there is, there is, in our institute, there is a group that is uh, specialized in uh, synthesis of nanoparticles with preferential shapes. And there are several methods that they use to, to synthesize the nanoparticles. One method is the micro emulsion, in which they uh, create um, a dispersion of, a, of a, 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 in this case, is it, a, a surfactant that uh, mixes with water and create these micelles. And these micelles are like micro reactors that limit the size of the nanoparticles. So the, nano, the size of the nanoparticles is limited by the size of these micelles. And the other method is the, um, the polyacrylate that makes a colloidal mixture. And in this case is the polyacrylate, which is a capping aging that is limiting the size of the nanoparticles. Uh, depending on the synthesis uh, procedure, they are able to synthesize particles that have very, very well-defined uh, uh, shapes and therefore very well-defined structures. So now that we know that the voltammogram is related with the, with the different contribution from the different facets, so we can see here, these are spherical particles. We can see a polycrystalline, basically polycrystalline response. Here we have cubes. So we have this contribution from the terraces that's very, very well defined. Here we have uh, tetrahedra and octahedra that give us this contribution from the 111. So all the knowledge that we have gathered from the study of uh, single crystals can now be applied to understand the behavior of these uh, nanoparticle with preferential shapes. Also with the microemulsion method, they found that using um, a high concentration of uh, hydrochloric acid, they could get also very nice cubes and very uh, nice example of their reactivity is the oxidation of ammonia. The oxidation of ammonia is very sensitive to the presence of one zero zero sites. It's, the current is much, much higher in platinum one one zero zero than on polycrystalline platinum. So uh, this is like a very, very, nice benchmark to test the nanoparticles. In this case, it is shown the effect of step surfaces. And we see that with the 100, we have the maximum current. And as we introduce steps, the current decreases. And with the different shaped nanoparticles, we see the maximum current with the cubic shape. So again, this is a nice way to bridge the gap between fundamental studies and applied electrocatalysis. And I think this is, this is enough. So just to conclude, the, the message that I want to, to give you is that uh, we have this tool that is a single crystal that can give us a very detailed information. So uh, I think this information uh, needs to be used to understand complex processes. And, and I think it's very important to, to acquire a very high quality uh, uh, measurements uh, that can be compared with, it, with the computational studies because these uh, energies of absorption, energies of activation that we can obtain from the, from the single crystal studies can uh, be used to 
to check the validity of computational studies, and then the computational studies can be used to um, improve our understanding of the experimental data. And for the future, I think uh, I wanted to finish by giving some idea of what is the, uh, what I, I see for the future of the field. I think we should move to different materials. For instance, we are working with copper, but copper is very, it's much difficult than platinum and we are still learning. So for platinum, we have learned during 40 years, we have learned a lot, but we are still discovering things. For instance, this uh, cooling in CO uh, has been found after 35 years working with platinum. So we still need to learn, we still need to go through the same path for copper and for other materials. For carbon is obviously much more complicated because we have a more heterogeneous surface. We can also try to apply the same methodology to uh, alloys. And then on the, this is on the side of the electrode and on the side of the, of the solvent, we are trying to move to ionic liquids and to organic solvents. But again, we are like in the infancy, like in the 80s when they started to publish uh, uh, the first results with the single crystals in water. Now we are in this stage uh, with the ionic liquids and another not, uh, not uh, aqueous solvents. So we need to, to learn what is the good uh, voltammogram. We can see different voltammograms from different laboratories. And uh, we have to learn all of this and to go the same path we have gone with aqua solution, but now with uh, these uh, solvents. So just to finish uh, a round of uh, acknowledgement. So this is a very old picture that uh, was taken in 2013. Um, and I want to, to mention uh, uh, Professor Juan Feliu, who established the, the field of uh, single crystal electrochemistry in Alicante. Professor Antonio Aldad, who sadly passed away a few years later that this picture was taken. Uh, Enrique Reo, uh, he's also part of my research group. Uh, Ricardo uh, Martinez Incapié, who did a lot of studies with the CO displacement at uh, neutral pHs. Uh, Jose Soya, who is the person uh, responsible in, in our institute for the synthesis of nanoparticles, together with Fran Vidal and Antonio Rodes, who is uh, the expert in infrared spectroscopy that I didn't have time to, to show you, but it's also something that we are working very, very intensively in our group. And uh, Nuria Garcia, that was not in this picture, but she was uh, responsible for the first experiment with the laser equipment. And thank you all of you for your, for your attention. Thank you so much, Victor. It was a very interesting talk and really long one. Yeah, um, sorry, really, sorry for that. <laughs> no, we really appreciate this kind of talks. Um, so we are open to questions. I know that the audience is probably very tired. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to raise your hand or um, unmute yourself and proceed with it. And maybe I can start. So uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, so you mentioned that the cleaning of the surface of platinum or any uh, metal single crystal has to be done ideally under um, flame annealing conditions. Mm. Are there ways to do this electrochemically? I know that there are groups who try to do this. There are some reports showing certain um, progress, but it feels like it's a bit inconsistent. What is your opinion about this electrochemical cleaning of uh, the surface? Well, uh, for instance, for, for copper, I know that you need to use this electrochemical cleaning because you cannot do the flame annealing. And as you said, there is some inconsistent results. So this is what I meant that we are now at this, at the same stage that we were with platinum in the eighties. So we, are, we have to learn what is the good uh, voltammetry for, for instance, in the case of copper or silver or whatever. And, and, and for, in the case of copper, for instance, we have published a, a paper one or two years ago that we, when we point out that the, uh, the voltammetry is very different just if you use a glass cell or if you use a Teflon cell. And the reason is because uh, uh, in alkaline media, the glass is corroded and there is some contamination that modifies the voltammetric behavior of copper. 
So if you are using polycrystalline copper, probably you, you will not see this, but this doesn't mean that it's not there. Uh, or or, or even, even with platinum, this is something that is important to point out that um, people that work with uh, polycrystalline materials or nanoparticles uh, often uh, have the misleading idea that uh, they are, the, the, these materials are less sensitive to contamination. And when you work with finger crystal, then you need to be very careful with cleaning and also and so on. And this is not not like that. The, the, what is happening is that the finger crystal is uh, it gives you a very reproducible voltamoran, so you can detect very easily that it's contaminated. So if you are working with another surface, uh, it doesn't mean that it's not contaminated. It is also contaminated, so you are not uh, able to see it. So. Uh, we need to, as you as you mentioned, we need to establish what is the good, uh, uh, like fingerprint, voltammetric fingerprint, and then um, establish the methodology that it gives this fingerprint in a reproducible way. And for instance, in the case of copper, it was electrochemical cleaning, but still, I think there is a lot of uh, road ahead that we need to go until we are sure that this is the good, the clean surface, the water surface, where we need a lot of um, STM measurements, uh, maybe uh, other measurements, infrared measurements to, to, to check that it's clean, that it's older, mm -hmm. and then we will establish this as a fingerprint. I see. And when it comes to nanoparticles, you show that you can um, get to a certain extent the reproducibility of how Facet, so from faceted nanoparticles to reproducibility of your single crystals, but nanoparticles are prepared in, in that sense in a, in a fairly uh, dirty environment chemically, right? Yes. So um, do we have to care about it then in your experiments or when it comes to this comparison, then in principle your results uh, with nanoparticles are still um, useful? Well, this, this was the, the struggle that uh, I, I mentioned, Jose Soya and Fran Vidal, uh, they worked for, for several years to establish a protocol to clean the nanoparticles. It was not obvious how to clean the nanoparticles. And every time they come with a new methodology for, for you know, synthetic methodology to get uh, like uh, nice cubes or nice uh, otahidea or tetahidea, it's not only that uh, you are getting the nice shape, you have to be able to clean. So maybe your caping agent is so strongly absorbed that you cannot clean. Then you are getting the nice shape, but this is not useful for, for uh, electrochemistry. So after many, many years of experience, they come to a state where they can uh, guarantee that the, the surface is clean but not every study that you see in the literature correspond to clean nanoparticles. You need to be aware of that. That's a very good point. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, Ilya. I'm uh, Victor, thank you very much for this really interesting presentation. I uh, enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you for reference to uh, old uh, time work by Funke. Mm. Uh, founding father of all the hydrogen nitros, indeed. Of course. Uh, uh, the question I have is related to nanoparticles. Uh, you highlighted the concept of a complexity of a, of a response. Uh, my question is more on a technical side. Starting with, uh, with the solution of nanoparticles, how would you assemble them on the working electrodes to ensure good contact and correct orientation? And Andrew already, uh, been half of my question regarding to the cleanness of this nanoparticle surface, which is quite complicated. Uh, so you're starting with the complicated distribution of particles, uh, not uh, and so on and so on. So it would be interesting to hear your opinion on this. Mm. So for, for the distribution of the nanoparticles on the electrode, the procedure that they use typically is to disperse uh, as a colloid and then to take a drop and to deposit a drop into on, onto a, a substrate. So the substrate can be glassy carbon or can be gold. For instance, if you want very, very clean conditions, gold is ideal because you can flame anneal the gold. So the substrate is very, very clean. And then you put your drop of uh, the suspension of nanoparticles and you are allowed to evaporate. 
And then you have to, to clean. So there are different protocols for cleaning. So uh, from acetone, that can be uh, useful to remove organic material. From then you may do some uh, absorption of carbon monoxide for platinum because as carbon monoxide absorbs very strongly on the, on the platinum and displaces uh, contaminants. And I have seen also uh, hydrogen evolution uh, for, for a very high over voltage, uh, you produce a lot of uh, hydrogen bubbles and this uh, mechanically cleans the, the surface of the nanoparticles. So you have to check a combination of all these uh, procedures to, to get the, the, clean, the, clean, um, the clean surface. And then you test by voltammetry because uh, what you can do is just to repeat the cleaning procedure and then you get like a maximum degree of cleanliness and day after day you get used to what is your benchmark, what is your, your fingerprint for a clean surface. So if you reach this, you know that you have a clean surface. But uh, regarding the um, connection with the electrode, as far as I know, there is no problem. So just uh, with a drop of, uh, of a suspension and allowing to dry, there is a good connection with the, with the electrode. So in this case, you would have an aggregate of nanoparticles. There is no a true dispersion of the nanoparticles, but still you keep the shape of the nanoparticles uh, that you have synthesized. So to get a dispersion of nanoparticles, you would have to do a, a substrate like a carbon, uh, like a carbon, um, um, Carbon activated carbon or carbon particles where you deposit the nanoparticles to, to have them separated, but then it's less clean. So it's a compromise between uh, aggregation and cleanliness. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peter. Yeah, uh, thank you, Victor, for a very nice uh, didactic lecture. I really enjoyed it, even though it was uh, lasted too long. Um, my question is that it's a lot, but I'm worried about, uh, I'm just concerned about the structure, the structural stability of this. Of course, you didn't mention that. So if you, I did see that you measure also under different conditions, also even a high pH. Uh, and then do you see any difference in the restructuring of the structure as a function of, you know, the facets that you're looking at in this? Because I miss it out in the, in the presentation. You, you mean the... Uh, for instance, for the step surfaces, if they are stable in different uh, pH? Yes. Uh, well, this you, you have to rely on STM studies. So uh, from the electrochemical point of view, what we can measure is the charge con corresponding to different, to different uh, contribution to the step and to the terrace. And uh, to be honest, there are not so many studies in the high pH. So, Mm, I would say that uh, is something that we need to do. We uh, still need to look carefully if uh, the, we can uh, be sure that the structure is uh, stable at high pH. But uh, in uh, general terms, the voltammetry is uh, consistent with the hard sphere model. So this consistency between the contribution from the step and contribution from the terrace with the hard sphere model is what give us the confidence that uh, the structure is uh, more or less stable. We don't wow. see we don't see changes. So if if it were not stable, you would see changes with the voltammetry with time, and we don't see that. We see a, a stable voltammogram, and then we see a voltammetry that is consistent with the hard sphere model. This is all we can say. So, but it's true that uh, it would require STM studies, careful STM studies, to be sure that this is stable. Yeah, I'm mentioning this because there's, um, I think, a recent article from the group of Macopa where they also show that uh, serious restructuring of the platinum electrode, uh, that sometimes it can also even have interaction with the hydrogen to have embrittlement of, of the platinum. But I think uh, so. That's what I'm asking about if this was also taken into consideration, you know, um, in these studies, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Always, it, it will depend on the condition that you su you submit your, your electrode. If you go to very low potential, then you may, may have 
uh, hydrogen inside the the crystallographic uh, network or if you go to to very uh, alkaline pHs you may have uh, some uh, dissolution of platinum I don't know but under standard condition that we use uh, I can tell that the voltamoram is stable so we assume that the surface is stable okay okay thank you yeah. okay Thank you, Peter. Maybe I can also ask you, uh, Victor, about the implementation of the single crystalline electrochemistry that um, the rotating disk electrodes. Um, do you see that being feasible? I know that there are reports, of course, that show it. But, well, it was. Um, you it can was, comment on that. It was uh, Nenad Magwick, the first who, who did the implementation of the single crystal with the rotating uh, disk electrode. And in this case, he used a cylinder that he uh, pressed against a cylinder of Teflon. So he embedded the electrode into the Teflon. Uh, in this case, uh, the problem is that uh, you have the, some degree of contamination. It cannot be as clean as with the bead electrode because with the bead electrode, you flame anneal and it is clean. In this case, you flame anneal, but then you have to do some manipulation that leads to some degree of contamination. So the question that we need to ask is whether these uh, results as significant or not. So, uh, I mean, uh, this is the best we can do, but the best we can do is enough uh, mm -hmm. in the case of, of this rotating this electrode. So instead of this approach, what we are doing is the hanging meniscus rotating electrode. Uh, in the hanging meniscus configuration, we can use the flame annealing, the electrode is clean, and then uh, the, the mass transport is more or less uh, the same as the Levitch equation. So. We can assume that the mass transport is well controlled and we can we can work with the hanging meniscus. But in this case, there is some uh, degree of dependence of the height of the meniscus. So it's not so well defined as with the real this electrode. So it's a compromise again between the cleanliness and the um, the, the control of the in this case of the mass transport. So I, again, my, 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 I think this is well. It's a, it's a pity that uh, there is so few people in the in the audience now. But I think a very important message is that when you do a very sophisticated experiment uh, via a rotating this electrode or via single uh, synchrotron experiment, um, even the best you can do is maybe not enough. So if you do an experiment in the synchrotron X-ray uh, diffraction experiment that takes several hours. Uh, maybe you are doing your best to get the cleanest surface possible, but what you get is not representative of the, dia, of the real surface. So mm -hmm. this is something that, I mean, it's like saying it's not your fault, it's, it's that it's, the best you can do is not enough. Yep, that's, that's how it works. Uh, but is it, I'm just curious, if you use, a, say, an argon box, or like a glove box, Hmm. But it filled with an um, inert environment. Is there any way to prevent significant contamination this way, or it's so contaminating so quickly that it, it's enough to have a sub PPB levels? I I would, I have no experience. Probably it would be the way to go. If you want to increase the time uh, that the surface is clean, and then you you need to go to this kind of uh, glove box or or whatever. But sometimes it's not possible. You cannot mm, mount a book of box in the synchrotron facility. <laughs> so, so right. the, or I don't know, maybe the manipulation of, I don't know, STM. For the STM, uh, sometimes it takes hours to get an image. Uh, is the surface clean after hours? I don't know. Probably it's better if you put the STM in a glove box. But is it possible for your equipment, you know, this is this is the kind of question that we need to ask. So so we need to to be critical with the with all the results that take a long time to acquire. Even if the experimentalist is very good, is very skilled, maybe the best is not enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one more question about the assumption that you've made, and uh, I think this is where maybe you can comment a bit more. So you said that you're assuming that each platinum on platinum atom of the surface takes one electron. Um, 
upon absorption. So uh, in in general, is it it's only for hydrogen, right? That's what you're yes, why you're sure. assuming. Mm -hmm. No, no, this is this is not for hydrogen or for any. This is a reference uh, number. So we are assuming one electron to get a reference number. So we get 240. So this is a reference number. And then we compare this reference number to whatever reaction we are studying. If it is copper, UPD, for instance, it would be two electrons. So it would, or if it is CO oxidation, it would be two electrons. So we compare the charge for CO, for copper, for whatever, with 240, because 240 is our reference number. So it's a number that we, we know by heart. It's a number that we, we are using all the time. Uh-huh, interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Every and, and time you, you want to calculate a coverage of something, you have to compare with this number. So of course, yeah. Yep, yep. but, but what I mean is uh, typically uh, in the old literature, the coverage was defined as the, as the uh, concentration of the surface divided by the maximum concentration of the surface. Uh, and normally what we do is to divide the concentration of the surface by this uh, number of platinum atoms. So instead of calculating the coverage as a percentage uh, of the maximum, we calculate as a percentage of platinum atoms. So mm -hmm. we say we have one molecule for each platinum, or we have one tenth of a molecule for each platinum, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, regarding the um, entropy part, the one of the last points that you discussed yes, in your presentation, yes. is it possible, uh, maybe it's a bit hypothetical, but is it possible to use the change in entropy as, um, as an input to calculate or evaluate at least the degree of water molecule ordering close to the interface or within the double layer? Yes, 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 it, it is. Uh, so can you evaluate sort of the, the get, getting some numbers uh, with certain precision, but still? Well, we, we, what we do is to measure the experimental value, and then uh, we wait for some computational chemist who is able to make the model and uh -huh. to compare because we don't have this skill. So right. what we can measure is the uh, entropy. And we are sure our assumption is that the entropy is maximum at the potential of zero charge, <clears throat> and then uh, the entropy decreases as when you move further from the potential of zero charge. But the magnitude of this decrease, we need to wait for someone with theoretical skills to calculate that. Mm -hmm. okay. but, but, but it should be it should be possible. It should be possible. Um, right. So previously, when we discussed the double layer structure, we had a few theoreticians, and the the main message was that at the interface, water molecules still are heavily disordered. So you don't expect to have any sort of um, well-defined order of the dipoles because of the temperature effects. Yes, yes, I, I heard that, but I think that even if there is a small degree of order, it's enough to have a potential contribution. So this dipolar contribution is what we are disordering with the increase of temperature. So uh, in the draws that I made, I always draw the water or hydrogen up or hydrogen down, but this is just a sketch that I do. So I am, I am aware that it's not like that. You have a degree of disorder, and then we increase this degree of disorder. But even uh, at room temperature, we have some degree of uh, orientation that give us a potential contribution. This yeah. is our interpretation. Right, and this is why I was wondering about the numbers, because I think that there are a lot of conflicting opinions and numbers and from optical experiments about the, the um, dielectric constant of water there. Yeah. So it would be interesting to see what uh, your experiments with the uh, laser induced jump, temperature jump yes. techniques show. Yeah. yeah, so there are, uh, as I mentioned, there are two things you can measure with, if you change the temperature with a thermostat, then you are measuring the entropy of the absorption process, then you would have the entropy of hydrogen absorbed or the entropy of OH absorbed. And we compare this with very, very simple models of a totally mobile layer or totally immobile layer. 
And then if you are using the laser, so the idea is that you are doing the change of temperature so fast that there is no time for the absorption to respond. So you are measuring the um, entropy of the water. So you have, and then for the entropy of the water, we have not done any analysis because it's, it's beyond our, our knowledge. Right. Um, maybe I'll have one or two more questions and we will wrap it up. So the um, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, do you see that being um, able to give more information than what you've shown today? Because in this technique, I mean, we discussed it a few times, special potential dynamic implementation mm -hmm. of EIS. Um, yeah. Maybe you can also comment on that, like there's something extra that you can get. For it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The, the idea is that uh, to decouple uh, absorption from double layer, you need to go fast. And we are going fast because we are doing the temperature jam experiment. We are, but the other way to go fast is to do the impedance spectroscopy. Uh, so I think they are uh, somehow equivalent or complementary techniques because they allow to uh, separate different processes based on the time scale of the process. So uh, absolutely, the, uh, for the hydrogen absorption, you could separate hydrogen absorption from double layer phenomena. You could measure the rate of hydrogen absorption. For instance, recently we have published a study of the uh, rate of hydrogen absorption on platinum 111 in alkaline solution because in acid solution is so fast that it's not possible to measure this rate by a normal impedance uh, method. But in alkaline solution, you can measure the rate of hydrogen <coughs> absorption. And then we measure different temperatures and then we got the activation energy. So mm -hmm. we have this experimental measurement of the activation energy. And again, we are waiting for some computational theorists who will analyze this, this value and we contrast this value with they can say with the, the model. I mean, the idea is that now there are a lot of groups that are working in, in computational electrochemistry and uh, they are uh, improving the methodologies to incorporate the charge, to incorporate the electric field. So I think as a experimentalist, our role would be to give high quality data that they can compare, they can analyze. But we need to be sure that this data is really high quality. So this is this is like a message that I want to make. Yes, yes, this is this is the ultimate goal of using single crystals. Mm. Um, maybe the final question. So I, I know that Victor, you work also with um, enzymes. Right? Yes. Uh, so this is the question that I asked a number of times previously. But now I'm curious about your opinion, since you work with single crystals, so you come sort of from a slightly different background. Hmm. Uh, do you see any way of doing um, enzyme electrochemistry, electrochemistry on grafted surfaces in a, in a more simplistic way, if you look at uh, um, the uh, inorganic, organic interfaces, in a well-defined manner? Well, this is uh, this was my idea when I started in this field. So, if you see my papers in this, my contribution in this field, it was uh, using a single crystal as a substrate, and then using STM, uh, Raman spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy as the techniques to characterize. So, yes, yes, I think the the idea would be to use well-defined surfaces to study the enzyme or the biomolecule at the more detailed level, and then to extrapolate whatever knowledge you can get from these model systems to the real system that obviously is going to be more complex. But then you need, uh, the, the, the idea is the same. You need the knowledge from the fundamental uh, model system, simple system to extrapolate to the complex real system. So the way to go would be uh, well-defined surfaces, either gold or platinum or, or even hyperolytic graphite. And then uh, the typical methodologies of uh, surface science, like uh, STM, uh, infrared spectroscopy, and so on. Thank you. This is very important that you, you, you said it because 
Uh, I think for the audience, especially those who are interested in single crystals, so maybe coming from more of a organic chemistry backgrounds or some other um, bioelectric chemistry, it might be interesting to see that. Um, I think because very few people really try to do the model studies mm -hmm. on, on such systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, with with the single crystal, you can reach. Uh levels of details that you cannot reach with a, a more complex uh, substrate for instance in the case of enzymes we were able to see with the stm how with the assumption of, of, the, of the reaction of the enzyme with oxygen it was a lack case that was doing oxygen reduction we could see how the tunneling current changes uh, for the enzyme that is uh, oxidized or it is reduced this is in, uh, if it is uh, uh, bonded to oxygen or it is not bonded to oxygen. So you can uh, study the enzyme at a single molecule level. Mm -hmm. So this, this you can do with the single crystal as substrate. So the single crystal is not only uh, the goal of your study, it can also be the substrate that you use for a, a different study. So right. you need this well-defined substrate to build on top of that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victor. Uh, this was okay. amazing and, and, a, and a highly important talk for everyone who probably works or is thinking of working with single crystals. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. And this Thank is you. Finishing the today's colloquium. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share. Okay. Yeah. Have a nice. Evening. Okay, you too. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye.